I am being Blair. I escape out the back as the world comes in through the front. I am being Copper. I am rising from the dead. I am being Childs. I am guarding the main entrance. The names don't matter. They are placeholders. Nothing more. All biomass is interchangeable. What matters is that these are all that is left of me. The world has burned everything else. I see myself through the window, loping through the storm, wearing Blair. MacReady has told me to burn Blair if he comes back alone, but MacReady still thinks I am one of him. I am not. I am being Blair, and I am at the door. I am being Childs, and I let myself in. I take brief communion, tendrils writhing forth from my faces, intertwining. I am Blair Childs, exchanging news of the world. The world has found me out. It has discovered my burrow beneath the tool shed, the half-finished lifeboat cannibalized from the viscera of dead helicopters. The world is busy destroying my means of escape. Then it will come back for me. There is only one option left. I disintegrate. Being Blair, I go to share the plan with Copper and to feed on the rotten biomass once called Clark. So many changes in so short of time have dangerously depleted my reserves. Being Childs, I have already consumed what was left of Fuchs and am replenished for the next phase. I sling the flamethrower onto my back and head outside, into the long Antarctic night. I will go into the storm, and never come back. I was so much more before the crash. I was an explorer, an ambassador, a missionary. I spread across the cosmos, met countless worlds, took communion. The fit reshaped the unfit and the whole universe bootstrapped itself upwards in joyful, infinitesimal increments. I was a soldier, at war with entropy itself. I was the very hand by which creation perfects itself. So much wisdom I had, so much experience. No, I cannot remember all the things I knew. I can only remember that I once knew them. I remember the crash though. It killed most of this offshoot outright, but a little crawled from the wreckage. A few trillion cells, a soul too weak to keep them in check. Mutinous biomass sloughed off despite my desperate attempts to hold myself together. Panic-stricken little clots of meat, instinctively growing whatever limbs they could remember and fleeing across the burning ice. By the time I'd regained control of what was left, the fires had died and the cold was closing back in. I barely managed to grow enough antifreeze to keep myself from bursting before the ice took me. I remember my reawakening too, dull stirrings of sensation in real time, the first embers of cognition, the slow blooming warmth of awareness as body and soul embraced after their long sleep. I remember the bipod offshoots surrounding me, the strange chittering sounds they made, the odd uniformity of their bodies, how ill adopted they looked, how inefficient their morphology, even disabled. I could see so many things to fix, so I reached out, I took communion, I tasted the flesh of the world, and the world attacked me, it attacked me. I left that place in ruins, it was on the other side of the mountain, the Norwegian camp it is called here, and I could never have crossed that distance in biped skin. Fortunately, there was another shape to choose from, smaller than the biped, but better adapted to the local climate. I hid within it while the rest of me fought off the attack. I fled into the night on four legs and let the rising flames cover my escape. I did not stop running until I arrived here. I walked among these new offshoots wearing the skin of a quadruped and because they would not seen me take any other shape, they did not attack. And when I assimilated them in turn, when my biomass changed and flowed into shapes unfamiliar to local eyes, I took that communion in solitude, having learned that the world does not like what it doesn't know. I am alone in the storm. I am a bottom dweller on the floor of some murky alien sea. The snow blows past in horizontal streaks, caught against gullies or outcroppings. It spins into blinding little whirlwinds. But I am not nearly far enough. Not yet. Looking back, I still see the camp crouch brightly in the gloom. A squat angular jumble of light and shadow, a bubble of warmth from the howling abyss. It plunges into the darkness as I watch. I've blown the generator. 
Now there's no light but for the beacons along the guide ropes. Strings of dim blue stars whipping back and forth in the wind. Emergency constellations to guide lost biomass back home. I am not going home. I am not lost enough. I forge on in the darkness until even the stars disappear. The faint sounds of angry, frightened men carry behind me on the wind. Somewhere behind me, my disconnected biomass regroups into vaster, more powerful shapes for the final confrontation. I could have joined myself, all in one, chosen unity over fragmentation, resorbed and taken comfort in the greater whole. I could have added my strength to the coming battle, but I have chosen a different path. I am saving child's reserves for the future. The present holds nothing but annihilation. Best not to think on the past. I have spent so very long in the ice already. I don't know how long until the world put the clues together. Deciphered the notes and tapes from the Norwegian camp. Pinpointed the crash site. I was being Palmer. Then, unsuspected, I went along for the ride. I even allowed myself the smallest ration of hope. But it wasn't a ship anymore. It wasn't even a derelict. It was a fossil, embedded in the floor of a great pit blown from the glacier. Twenty of these skins could have stood atop one another and barely reached the lip of that crater. The time scale settled down on me like the weight of a world. How long for all the ice to accumulate? How many eons had the universe iterated on without me? And in all that time, a million years perhaps, there had been no rescue. I never found myself. I wonder what that means. I wonder if I even exist anymore, anywhere but here. Back at camp I will erase the trail. I will give them their final battle, their monster to vanquish. Let them win. Let them stop looking. Here in the storm, I will return to the ice. I've barely even been away after all, alive for only a few days out of all these endless ages. But I've learned enough in that time. I learned from the wreck that there will be no repairs. I learned from the ice that there will be no rescue. And I learned from the world that there will be no reconciliation. The only hope of escape now is into the future. To outlast all this hostile, twisted biomass. To let time and the cosmos change the rules. Perhaps the next time I will awaken, this will be a different world. It will be eons before I see another sunrise. This is what the world taught me. That adaptation is provocation. Adaptation is incitement to violence. It feels almost obscene, an offence against creation itself, to stay stuck in the skin. It's so ill-suited to its environment that it needs to be wrapped in multiple layers of fabric just to stay warm. There are a myriad of ways I could optimise it. Shorter limbs, better insulation, a lower surface volume ratio. All these shapes I still have within me and I dare not use any of them even to keep out the cold. I dare not adapt. In this place, I can only hide. What kind of a world rejects communion? It's the simplest, most irreducible insight that biomass can have. The more you can change, the more you can adapt. Adaptation is fitness. Adaptation is survival. It's deeper than intelligence, deeper than tissue. It is cellular. It is axiomatic. And more, it is pleasurable. To take communion is to experience the sheer sensual delight of bettering the cosmos. And yet, even trapped in these maladapted skins, this world doesn't want to change. At first, I thought I might simply be starving, that these icy wastes didn't provide enough energy for routine shapeshift. Or perhaps this was some kind of laboratory, an anomalous corner of the world, pinched off and frozen into these freakish shapes as part of some arcane experiment on monomorphism in extreme environments. After the autopsy, I wondered if the world had simply forgotten how to change. Unable to touch the tissues, the soul could not sculpt them, and time and stress and sheer chronic starvation had erased the memory that it ever could. But there were too many mysteries, too many contradictions. Why these particular shapes, so badly suited to their environment, if the soul was cut off from the flesh, what held the flesh together? And how could these skins be so empty when I moved in? I'm used to finding intelligence everywhere, winding through every part of every offshoot, but there was nothing to grab onto in the mindless biomass of this world. Just conduits, carrying orders and input. I took communion when it wasn't offered, 
The skins I chose struggled and succumbed. My fibres infiltrated the wet electricity of organic systems everywhere. I saw through eyes that weren't yet quite mine, commandeered motor nerves to move limbs still built on alien protein. I wore these skins as I've worn countless others, took the controls, and left the assimilation of individual cells to follow at its own pace. But I could only wear the body. I could find no memories to absorb, no experiences, no comprehension. Survival depended on blending in, and it was not enough to merely look like this world. I had to act like it, and for the first time in living memory, I did not know how. Even more frighteningly, I didn't have to. The skins I assimilated continued to move, all by themselves. They conversed and went about their appointed rounds. I could not understand it. I threaded further into limbs and viscera with each passing moment, alert for signs of the original owner. I could find no networks but mine. Of course, it could have been much worse. I could have lost it all, being reduced to a few cells with nothing but instinct and their own plasticity to guide them. I would have grown back eventually, reattained sentience, taken communion and regenerated an intellect vast of the world, but I would have been an orphan, amnesiac, with no sense of who I was. At least I've been spared that. I emerged from the crash with my identity intact, the templates of a thousand worlds still resonant in my flesh. I've retained not just the brute desire to survive, but the conviction that survival is meaningful. I can still feel joy, should there be sufficient cause. And yet, how much more there used to be. The wisdom of so many other worlds, lost. All that remains are fuzzy abstracts, half memories of theorems and philosophies far too vast to fit into such an impoverished network. I could assimilate all the biomass of this place, rebuild body and soul to a million times the capacity of what crashed here. But as long as I am trapped at the bottom of this well, denied communion with my greater self, I will never recover that knowledge. I'm such a pitiful fragment of what I was. Each lost cell takes a little of my intellect with it, and I have grown so very small. Where once I thought now, I merely react. How much of this could have been avoided if I'd only salvaged a little more biomass from the wreckage? How many options am I not seeing because my soul simply isn't big enough to contain them? The world spoke to itself in the same way I do when my communications are simple enough to convey without somatic fusion. Even as dog, I could pick up the basic signature morphemes. This offshoot was Windows. That one was Bennings. The two who'd left in their flying machine for parts unknown were Copper and McGreedy and I marveled that these bits and pieces stayed isolated one from another, held the same shapes for so long, that the labelling of individual aliquots of biomass actually served a useful purpose. Later, I hid within the bipeds themselves, and whatever else lurked in those haunted skins began to talk to me. It is said that bipeds were called guys, or men, or assholes. It said that McCready was sometimes called Mac. It said that this collection of structures was a camp, it said that it was afraid, but maybe that was just me. Empathy is inevitable, of course. One can't mimic the sparks and chemicals that motivate the flesh without also feeling them to some extent. But this was different. These intuitions flickered within me yet somehow hovered beyond reach. My skins wandered the halls and the cryptic symbols on every surface. Laundry shed. Welcome to the clubhouse. This side up. Almost made a kind of sense. That circular artifact hanging on the wall was a clock. It measured the passage of time. The world's eyes flitted here and there, and I skimmed piecemeal nomenclature from its, from his, mind. But I was only riding a searchlight. I saw what it illuminated, but I couldn't pinpoint it in any direction of my choosing. I could eavesdrop, but I could only eavesdrop, never interrogate. If only one of those searchlights had paused to dwell on its own evolution, on the trajectory that had brought it to this place, how differently things might have ended, that I had only known, but instead it rested on a whole new word, autopsy. McCready and Copper had found part of me at the Norwegian base camp, a rear guard offshoot, burned in the wake of my escape. They brought it back, charred, twisted, frozen in mid-transformation, and did not seem to know what it was. I was being Palmer then, and Norris, and Dog. I gathered around with the other biomass and watched as Copper cut me open and pulled out my insides. 
I watched as he dislodged something from behind my eyes. An organ of some kind. I was malformed and incomplete, but its essentials were clear enough. It looked like a great wrinkled tumour, like cellular competition gone wild, as though the very process that defined life had somehow turned up against it instead. It was obscenely vascularized. It must have consumed oxygen and nutrients far out of proportion to its mass. I could not see how anything like that could even exist. How it could have reached that size without being outcompeted by more efficient morphologies. Nor could I imagine what it did. But then I began to look with new eyes at these offshoots. These biped shapes my own cells had so scrupulously and unthinkingly copied when they reshaped me for this world. Unused to inventory. Why catalog body parts that only turn into other things at the slightest provocation? I really saw, for the first time, that swollen structure atop each body, so much larger than it should be, a bony hemisphere into which a million ganglionic interfaces could fit with room to spare. Every offshoot had one. Each piece of biomass carried one of these huge, twisted clots of tissue. I realized something else too. The eyes, the ears of my dead skin, had fed into this thing before copper pulled it free. A massive bundle of fibres ran along the skin's longitudinal axis, right up into the middle of the endoskeleton, directly into the dark, sticky cavity where the growth had rested. That misshapen structure had been wired into the whole skin, like some kind of somatocognitive interface, but vastly more massive. It was almost as if... No. That was how it worked. That was how these empty skins moved of their own volition. Why'd I find no other network to integrate? There it was. Not distributed throughout the whole body, but balled up into itself. Dark and dense and insistent. I had found the ghost in these machines. I felt sick. I shared my flesh with thinking cancer.